You're tuned in to Ask the Master Auto Technician. Car questions? Get answers right now. Call 850-763-0555. James Auto Center. We fix it right. Guaranteed. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah. All right, good morning, everybody. It is Wednesday morning, and it is, uh, well, we're going to talk a little bit about cars. Okay, I, there's been a little rash, I should say. I don't know if it's a rash or not. Ever since 2004, 2005, a lot of cars come into my shop. They have codes for the front oxygen sensors, or what we call the air fuel ratio sensors. They look like oxygen sensors. They kind of work the same way as oxygen sensors, but they're not oxygen sensors. They're called air fuel ratio sensors. Their mission is to keep it around one volt all the time. I mean, that's how critical it has to be. And it can make minute, precise adjustments by it, whether it be a little above one boat or a little below one boat. We're just talking about just a very, very little difference. But that, what it looks at, that in turn, since fuel allows fuel to go to the engine and then downstream after the catalytic converter, it wants to keep the computer, wants to keep those O2 sensors, not air fuel ratio sensors, even though they look the same as air fuel ratio sensors. These O2 sensors around 0 0.6, 0 0.7, somewhere around there, of a volt, steady, not bouncing up and down, which everybody's used to seeing on oxygen sensors. If you've known anything about oxygen sensors, ever since 1981 or 1980 and a half, Oxygen sensors either work rich or they work lean and are all the time going rich and lean, rich and lean, rich and lean, rich and lean, very, very fast. If you have a scanner, for every oscillation you see, there's probably another 10 or 15 oscillations you don't see because it's just that fast. But what it's trying to do is split the difference between uh, to get 14.7 to 1 air fuel ratio sensor. Well, that's what we want to see. That's in a perfect world, we have a 14.7 to 1 fuel ratio, air to, air to fuel ratio. 14.7 air to one part fuel. That's what is perfect. That's called stoichiometric. If you have that, life is good. But the problem is, you're not going to get 14.7 to 1 in all conditions of driving. You're idling, you're accelerating, you're stopping. Those change your stoichiometric fuel ratio. So the computer looks at that air fuel ratio sensor in the front, and it can see how, how quickly it's changing from 1 volt or 1 point, you know, 1, 1, or 0 0.99, right in that area right there. And it says, I can make adjustments to keep that rear oxygen sensor around 0 0.7. If it does that, then your oxygen sensor lasts forever and everything's a now, wonderful thing. You're talking about air fuel uh, ratios. Uh, air, well, the air fuel ratio sensors in the front. Right. And they look like oxygen sensors. And what about in the back? In the back, they're called oxygen sensors. Okay. Yeah, they're, I know that's sure. how they look the same. They got the same number of wires. But one of the reason, one of the ways I can tell, tell if it's an air fuel ratio sensor, <clears throat> excuse me, is look at the front oxygen sensor wiring. If you see one of the wiring is blue, you've got a blue wire, you should have a white wire, a black wire, another white wire, and usually it's a gray wire. If you see a gray wire, that's an oxygen sensor. If you see a blue wire, that's an air fuel ratio sensor. And I have a lot of people say, well, you know, What's the difference? You know, I can go buy an air fuel ratio sensor from the dealership for $300, or I can go to XYZ parts store and buy it for $100. And I'm going, you go buy that $100 one and you'll be pulling it right back out again. I'm serious, the reverse engineering is on air fuel ratio sensors are, well, all the thing it's gonna do is make your life miserable if you try to put an aftermarket one on there. Especially those people out there that like to cut them off and solder them back on with the universal ones. It doesn't work because you're not gonna believe this when I tell you that they actually get air mixture through the wiring and when you solder that you lose the ability for it to sample the air yeah i know whoever who would have ever thunk that i mean but the engineers came up with it and that's one of the, even the old single wire oxygen sensors had to test the air to see what was going on it had a little vent on the side of it and it was always looking at the atmospheric air to find out what was going on and what ended up happening is a lot of cars got oil on them and it killed them and everybody said well what killed it well that's what happened it got oil on it and it killed it so to avoid that they said well we'll just have it where it breathes through the wire so you have all these people out there trying to put aftermarket universal uh, oxygen sensors or air fuel ratio sensors on and they solder them on well if you do that the wire can't breathe I know that sounds hard to believe that it breathes through the wiring, but that's exactly what it does. And you put it on there and you'll say it's not right, you'll take it back, you'll get another one, and finally, you'll, after about the third or fourth one, you'll just give up and go buy one, or buy the right one. Then all of a sudden, your problems stop. I see that all the time. But on air fuel ratio sensors, even though this is a common problem where you'll go to an XYZ parts store and they'll say, oh, both your oxygen sensors are, have 
codes for them. You need to replace them. Oh, normally, excuse me, I shouldn't say oxygen sensors. They're going to say both your air fuel ratio sensors have codes. Yes, they can fail at the same time. It is possible, but normally, normally, what I found out, if you get an air fuel ratio sensor on the front that fail, both of them at the same time, you could have one that fails. That's, that's quite often. But having both of them fail at one time, there's two problems I usually have found. One, you popped a fuse. Yep, you popped a heater circuit fuse, and that can cause a problem. You'll get a code for them. And uh, everybody wants to change, sell the auction sensors, but please check the fuses first. Make sure you've got 12 volts going the auction sensor when the car is in the own position, key is in the own position. That's the, and I, I see that a lot of times. People come in, I've changed my auction sensors, I've done this, and I keep getting that. Well, why don't you check the fuses? I didn't know that. So check the fuses. But that's the other thing to call it. And the most common, besides fuses, that everybody checks, <clears throat> checks throws their hands up, that I really don't know, is reprogramming. We're seeing more and more of that. Matter of fact, I had a customer come in yesterday, 2009, 5.4, I believe what it was. Um, I can, it was a, it was a uh, Titan uh, General Motors product, Misty Titan, Ford product. It was a Lincoln Navigator. Car comes in, has, this is the customer's problem. They say it runs fine 99% of the time. But when I fill it up with gas, it, won't, it doesn't want to start, and then it smells like rotten eggs coming out the exhaust, and it runs terrible, and it spits, and it sputters. There's all sorts of stuff when I first fill it up. After I run it a while, it seems to be fine. And then sometimes the other, other problem I got besides the check engine light zone is I go down the highway, and everything's fine, and I have to slow down for a school zone. Sometimes if I slow down too fast, or I slow down and don't pay attention, and it's in gear, the engine will die. So when I have to slow down, I have to put the car in neutral and keep the RPMs up to keep it from dying. And I said, okay, wow. I said, that sounds to me like, you know, when you put gas in it, you may have a purge valve faulty. And she said, well, someone said something like that. And I said, well, wait a minute. What have you done to get this car corrected? Well, I've taken it to three shops and they've done this and they've done that and they've done this and they've done that. And I've got $900 in it and the car still runs bad. I went, wow, that sucks. So I said, let's take a look at it. So I got this information. I said, what codes do you have? And it had a P130 and a P150. And I said, well, ma'am, from my experience, I'm looking at your auction sensors on the rear, ones after the catalytic converter. They look perfect. They're right at 0.7. And I'm looking at your air-fuel ratio sensors in the front, and they're right at one volt. I said, they're working fine. The codes that I'm getting really don't make a whole lot of sense why they're setting, because they're working fine. And I said, these codes were set when the car was at operating temperature. You were sitting still. You just cranked the car up. I can see that. Uh, you weren't moving down the highway, but you were at operating temperature, so you probably just filled up with gas. Uh, guessing, I don't really know. I'm, I'm just figuring out what's happening. But you were at operating temperature. You weren't moving, and these, and these codes set. Uh, so that tells me you shut the car off, fired it back up, and it set in just a couple of minutes after the car was running because it, it was in closed loop. Because a car doesn't take very long to go in a closed loop. And about, today's car is about 30 seconds. Used to be three to five minutes. Now they do in about 30 seconds. They're in closed loop. The computer takes over the control of the car and it makes sure the air fuel mixture is at that 14.7 to 1 stoichiometric fuel ratio that we talked about earlier. That is what it's trying to do constantly. The reason it's doing that is trying to save the catalytic converter. And at the same time, you get better fuel mileage. You know, that seems to be, <laughs> that seems to be the uh, intended consequences of saving the catalytic converter gives better fuel mileage. They're still trying to get that elusive 45 point three miles per gallon or whatever it's supposed to be by the year 2525 uh, on CAFE standards, that's a car average fuel economy. Um, you know, that's going to be coming out, but I don't know if they're going to make it or not. They may, they may not. Who knows what's going to happen? But the point being is there's a reprogramming. If you get two codes, you constantly keep coming back and you can't figure out what's wrong with it. That's why it's so very, very important. You people that own Ford, Chrysler, Hondas, Toyotas, all these, you know, whatever brand you have, when you have a drivability problem, yes, a drivability problem, and you've got a check engine light, and you love your technician, and you go to them, and they take good care of your car, but they scratch their head and say, I don't know what's wrong with it. You need to find a shop that has the factory scanner. Don't we have classes on this yeah. all the time. This is one of the topics that our guys really don't need a whole lot of help with because we do so much reprogramming. Yeah, we had a class last, that was our last class was reprogramming. And my guys got, uh, matter of fact, I think they, <laughs> they were bragging when they got back, they were teaching the instructor a few little tricks. But we've been reprogramming for 
but like we said, you know, this is, this is the one thing that the consumer really needs to talk to their yeah, technicians about. they do. About. And here's what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to put anyone down. I want you, the customer, to insist that your technician get a scanner and get a web or get access to a website that has a factory scanner and the factory downloads. Because if you've got a problem on your car and he can't go to the, to a, to the internet, and well, I, look, a lot of shops don't even have what I have. I have direct hit search. It's it's something that I don't know what we pay for it. Sixty dollars a month, hundred dollars a month. I don't know what we pay for it. It's worth it. And that direct hit is by Identifix, and I can actually take the codes, punch it in, and it says, these are the things that we found wrong with it. Here's how you check it, and this is all the fixes that we did on it. And just about every one of them over here that had this problem with PO130 or PO150 was either they had A, they had bad air fuel ratio sensors, or B, they had reprogramming. Honest to goodness. So when we go back there and we look at the car, we get customer permission to look at the car, and we're going to diagnose the car. I think this is what your problem is. I'm, you know, it sure looks like it. And uh, and the and the purge valve, you know, we're going to check that out because there's a code for it. But we don't know if that's bad or not. Sure enough, we check it out. The purge valves own all the time. It's, I mean, it's own all the time. So it's sucking fuel out of that fuel tank, and that's not a good thing. So that, along with the oxygen sensors being a reprogramming, there was nothing wrong with these air fuel ratio sensors. And I think the customers said they had changed them and they were at $300 a piece. And I went, wow, they're not, like I said, they're not cheap. They're very expensive, but they have to be the ones from the manufacturer on there. Do not reverse engineer them. Even though I love Napa, I love CarQuest, I love all those aftermarket parts companies out there. They give me some great deals. When it comes to OBD2, auction sensors, if it's not original equipment, I don't buy it. Now, I'll get cars at Napa does sell auction sensors that are original equipment, and I'll buy them in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. But if, got our, if a car is less than 10 years old, normally they're not OE. They've been reverse engineered, and that's what they do because they're not, because after 10 years, the manufacturer does not support the vehicles anymore. That's right. You, even when it comes to electronics, I had over almost a half a million dollars worth of electronics in the back back there uh, by Snap-on. And uh, man, I've been collecting them for years and years. It's called Simutech, where we actually sit there and go into the car, interface our computer between the car's engine and the car's computer, and we were seeing what was going on. Wonderful piece of equipment. It really helped me out a lot. Made lots of money off of it. But after 10 years, they said, we're not going to support it anymore. No matter what you say, we don't care. And I did. I, there was half a million dollars. I literally, when it broke, I literally threw in the garbage can and it went out to the steel field dump. That's exactly where it went. But things are changing out there and fixing cars is a lot more involved than just changing parts. So you people out there that think that the only way to fix a car is if you got a bad part, change the part. A lot of times you have to put the part on there and marry the part to the car to make sure the car recognizes that this part is part of this car. Because if you don't do it, it's still going to be broke, honestly, or it's going to come back broke again. That's what ends up happening. A lot of times people put the part on there, it goes away, and three months later they're back again with that part bad because it wasn't controlling the amperage or whatever. That's where the reprogramming comes in to keep these things from breaking again. Hey, this is James Morris. you got a car question, give us a call 850-763-0555. I believe we got Mike Hill calling all the way. Uh, he's a legislator that's termed out. And we're going to talk a little bit about crony capitalism, I think, and we may be talking about Florida Enterprise. Now, she is, he is taking uh, Karen's spot this morning, so he may call, and then again, he may not. So we'll be right back in a few minutes with Ask the Master Auto Technician. James Auto Center, we fix it right